It was June of 2008. I had just turned 17 and I was attending a figure skating camp in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Some of the local athletes were having people over at a house. I had always been hyper-focused on skating, so I had never really been to a party before. I knew everyone there, so it felt like it was okay to have a little fun. I also had never had anything to drink before, but all of my friends were having some, and I was curious. I wanted to fit in. As the party wound down, no one could drive me back to the hotel where I was staying, so a few other girls and I had to spend the night. It felt safe. My friends were there. I was offered up a bed that I didn't think twice about taking, and I soon drifted off to sleep. It was the middle of the night when I felt him crawl into my bed. I had been sleeping, and I didn't move because I didn't understand what it meant. I thought he just wanted a place to sleep. But then he started kissing my neck. I pretended to be deep asleep, hoping he would stop. He didn't. When his hands started to wander, when he started touching me, groping my body, I tried to shift around so that he would think I was waking up and he would stop. He didn't. Looking back now, I didn't understand that his hands knew the way around a woman's body because he was 22. He was a man. But I was just a girl. When he continued to wander further over my body, I started to get scared because he was so much bigger than I was. I didn't know if I could push him off of me. I just continued to lie there, pretending to be asleep, hoping that he would get bored and go somewhere else. He didn't. I then felt myself starting to cry and I knew I had to make a choice. I opened my eyes and I pulled away from him as he kissed my neck. I grabbed his invading hand and I told him to stop. And he did. He looked at me for a few seconds, quietly got up and left the room. All of this happened over the period of about five minutes. And that is such a small amount of time, but it's haunted me ever since. The next morning, he acted like nothing happened, so I acted like nothing happened. I thought that maybe I had misinterpreted it all. In 2008, I didn't have the knowledge and empowerment that came along with the Me Too movement. No one had explained consent to me. Something that was so ambiguous is very clear now. I was sexually assaulted. As the days went by, I told two people close to me about what happened, but otherwise I didn't say or do anything else. I just wanted it to go away. I come from a military family and I was trained to put my head down and keep going in the face of adversity. I also was afraid that if I told my parents, they would get mad at me for being at a party, so I kept quiet. There was also this. I was a young skater coming up through the ranks in a judge sport. I didn't want to stir the pot. I didn't want to add anything to my career that would make me seem undesirable or dramatic. I didn't want to be known in figure skating as the athlete who would cause any trouble. And I genuinely didn't feel like anyone would listen to me anyway. Everyone really liked this guy. I even liked him. How could someone so beloved do such a bad thing? As I think back on it, this is the most important part of my story. Good people can hurt you too. Just because someone is nice, just because they do all the right things, just because they make people laugh, doesn't mean that they are incapable of hurt or abuse. No one is all good or all bad, but the good parts can't justify the hurt that is caused. I now know that regardless of the events of that night, I got into that bed thinking that I was safe to just fall asleep. He was the one who took away that safety. I went into that house just wanting to have fun with my friends. He was the one who shattered all of that. Going to that party in no way, shape, or form gave that man permission to touch me. 
I never once said anything that made him think that it was okay to take control of my body away from me. My presence at a party does not imply my consent. I wish that I could have learned that sooner. The years of guilt that I have felt should not have rested on me, but on him. I was sexually assaulted by John Coughlin. Over the past few months, as I decided to tell the story, I have wrestled with using John's name. He was a prominent figure skater who died by suicide in January, and so I fully understand the issues with naming him. But a name can shape so much of how my story is perceived. Without it, I know people will question my credibility. But this is not about a name. This is about the environment that allowed for that act to happen. I want the issue to feel real to people and for them to understand the dynamics of my sport where uncomfortable power imbalances thrive to this day. Athletes at the elite level have long been celebrated for their physical talent and abilities. I competed at that level for 15 years, from the age of 13 to the age of 27. Talent and ability, not age, place you into your social circle. It is not normal for kids and teenagers to be in the same social environment as adults, but in figure skating, it happens all the time. 13-year-old girls can be on the same international team as 21-year-old men, traveling on the same flights, staying in the same hotels, eating all of their meals together. This year, I watched a phenomenal young superstar, Alyssa Liu, become the U.S. figure skating national champion at just 13. It was in that moment that I knew I had to come forward with my story. I want to make this sport safer for those kids. I went to U.S. figure skating and proposed changes to athlete education and wellness designed to keep these young skaters as safe as possible. The bottom line is people need to talk more about this. As a 17-year-old in skating, my social world was so small. As a man in his 20s in skating, his social scene was also minuscule, mostly just teenagers competing in the sport. This is a pressure cooker environment that will continue to create uncomfortable and inappropriate, unsafe workplaces unless something is done about it. I want kids to be able to stay kids in this sport. People need to start talking about how to create boundaries. My talent and ability should not have been what defined the people who are around me. I do not see myself as a victim, and I never want anyone else to see me that way either. After that awful night in 2008, I moved on with my life, but I was always confused about what to think of him. He never apologized, and I never asked for an apology. We both moved forward, never acknowledging what he did to me. Coming forward now was a difficult choice to make. I know that there will be people who picked us apart, who criticize and question me. At the end of the day, however, I had to make a choice to stay quiet or to push forward and demand change in a sport that I love. When I looked at it that way, the decision became crystal clear. I chose to speak up.